Hello students, welcome to EPG Partshala. I am Dr. Zina Tikbal from Department of Pharmaceutics, Faculty of Pharmacy, Jamia Hamdard. Today we are going to deliberate upon the module titled Mucoadhesive Drug Delivery Systems and the paper which we are discussing is the Novel Drug Delivery System 1. The learning objectives today we will start. The first one is understanding the concept of bioaddition and mucoaddition. Then we will go in for the overview of mucoadhesive drug delivery systems and its types. We will then talk about the human mucous membrane, its structure and its composition. Later on, we will also deliberate upon the mechanisms of mucoadditions and the various theories which are associated with mucoaddition. Later on, we will also discuss the various types of polymers, its classification and finally, we will summarize the presentation. Students, before we get into the details of mucoadhesive drug delivery system, let us try to understand the concept of bioaddition or mucoaddition. Bioaddition is a phenomena where two materials adhere to each other by means of interfacial forces. One of these substances has to be of a biological origin and the two entities are essentially held together for a prolonged period of time. The terms bioaddition and mucoaddition are used interchangeably, but the latter is more specifically used when the adherence or attachment is onto the mucous coat on the surface of an epithelial tissue. We now will talk about the types of bioaddition or mucoaddition. Bioaddition or mucoaddition can be classified into three types. The first one is the addition where two biological substrates are involved such as the aggregation of the platelets and cell fusion. Secondly, there could be an addition of a biological substrate to an artificial object such as cell addition to cultured dishes. And the third one could be an addition of an artificial substance, primarily a delivery system which is attached to the, which is a delivery system which consists of any dosage form like that of an addition of a synthetic polymer to the dental gum for the drug delivery and treatment of diseases like periodontitis. To conclude and understand the difference between bioaddition and mucoaddition, mucoadhesive is something which is a more specific term where the biological matter is mucus. We will now move on to understanding in detail or rather take an overview of what is a mucoadhesive drug delivery system. To start with, mucoadhesive is a modern formulation approach of attaining controlled release of drug by designing a specialized drug delivery system which remains attached to the biological membrane for a prolonged duration of time while facilitating an intimate and intensified contact of the drug carrier with the underlying absorption surface of the epithelial barrier. Releasing the drug at the action site and eventually leading to an increase in bioavailability and giving both local and systemic effects. It is feasible to design a bio or mucoadhesive system in different dosage forms. Since the properties of adhesion largely depend on the features of the material used in its preparation. Therefore, several conventional drug delivery systems, which are already in use, can become bioadhesive 
opposed to redesigning by mere inclusion of bioadhesive substances in their formulations. We could have something like a tablet, which primarily was not mucoadhesive, but later on, when we added carbopole 934 type of polymers, we could easily convert that into a mucoadhesive tablet. Mucoadhesive substances could also be used as therapeutic agents per se. For example, to coat and protect and soothe the injured tissue, gastric ulcers or lesions of the oral mucosa. Or it could also be used primarily as lubricants in the oral cavity, in the eye or in the vaginal cavity. The use of the bioadhesive concept for drug delivery is a very old one. Historically speaking, it was in the year 1847 when Soberero, a pharmaceutical researcher, focused on absorption of drugs via the mucous membranes of the oral cavity. Later on, in the years 1935 through 1944, the scientist Walton primarily focused on the systemic studies of oral cavity absorption. Till the year 1955 and 1965, there were a lot of reviews which were done on the systemic studies of the oral cavity absorption. Later, in the years 1980 and 1985, a group of scientists, primarily Smart, Peppers and Burry, they went into the nuances of the mucoadhesive systems. They worked upon elucidating the surface interfacial and molecular aspects of polymer bioaddition on soft tissues. Later in the decades of 90s, in the year 97 and 1998, scientists like Shoji et al. and Ahuja et al., primarily from Jamia Hamdard, worked on a lot of reviews of buccal mucosa as a route of systemic drug delivery. We have seen a huge surge from 2000 onwards where a large number of scientists are trying to harness the potential of mucoadhesives for the delivery of different types of drugs. Types of mucoadhesive drug delivery systems. We can primarily classify the mucoadhesive drug delivery system as four types. We can have them as solid, mucoadhesive drug delivery systems, semi-solid mucoadhesive formulations. We can also have liquid mucoadhesive formulations and we can have the fourth category that is miscellaneous mucoadhesive formulations. Beginning with the first one, as we talk of the solid systems, the first category is that of tablets. These are the commonest type of mucoadhesive systems which are able to adhere to the mucosal surface and form strong interactions by attracting water from the mucosal surface. Bacca stem is a classical example of a mucoadhesive tablet which is indicated for the treatment of nausea, vomiting and vertigo and is administered to the inside of the cheeks known as the buccal mucosa. We have the second category which is primarily referred to as inserts. We know that eye ailments like glaucoma often require frequent installation of eye drops but is accompanied by poor patient compliance. The frequency is so high that it becomes impossible for patient to maintain the desired dosage regimen. In such situations, mucoadhesive ocular inserts can overcome such problems by remaining adhered to the target site and deliver the drug over long periods of time. An example is that of pylogel which is used in the treatment of glaucoma, which is a condition in which we have a raised pressure in the eye. Pylogel contains the bioadhesive agent, namely carbomer 940, 
which minimizes irritation and prevents the loss of product by keeping the gel in place. We also have mucoadhesive lozenges. Mucoadhesive lozenges containing antibiotics and local anesthetics can be used topically to treat conditions affecting the mouth. Research has shown that bioadhesive lozenges are able to release drugs in a controlled manner by prolonging the drug release. We also now have multi-systems or multi-unit systems which can be learnt as microparticles or microcapsules. Such multi-unit systems could deliver drug at the mucosal sites like that of the GIT and periodontal cavity and could be loaded with antibiotics and other drugs to have a prolonged duration of action. We have the next category of mucoadhesive drug delivery systems which are called as semi-solid mucoadhesive formulations. They are primarily exemplified by the first type that is gels. Bioadhesive polymers that are able to form gels include polyacrylic acid which adheres to the mucosal surfaces in a cross-linked form. Gel formulations are used to target several parts of the body including the eye, vagina and oral cavity. An advantage of gels is that they are able to form a very close contact with mucosal membranes and rapidly release drugs at their site of absorption. In case of deep cavities like vagina, these could be easily applied with the specialized applicator devices. We have another category under this. Those are referred to as films. Bioadhesive or mucoadhesive films are flexible in nature. It can be used to directly deliver drugs to specific mucosal membranes at various slight sites like the mouth, cervix and vagina. They form a very close contact with the membrane and are able to deliver an accurate dose of drug at the site of absorption. An example of such a film is the bioadhesive film referred to as xylactin, which is used in the treatment of cold sores and mouth ulcers. The other category which we will discuss is the liquid mucoadhesive formulations. They can primarily be understood under two types. The first one is the viscous liquids and the second one is the gel forming liquids. We'll try to understand what do you mean by viscous liquids. Viscous liquids containing bioadhesive polymers such as carboxymethylcellulose may be used to protect mucosal membranes from damage and irritation. They can also be used to deliver drugs to these specific sites. A very typical example of viscous liquids is artificial tears which is a carbomer solution and is usually used to treat dry eye syndrome. The viscous liquids usually get their name because of the viscosity which they elicit. The second types of liquid mucoadhesive formulations include something which we refer to as gel forming liquids. These formulations are primarily administered as liquids but they undergo a change in the form in response to conditions such as temperature and pH. Such formulations are primarily used for the controlled release of drugs into the eye. The last type 
of the mucoadhesive drug delivery system is understood to be as the miscellaneous mucoadhesive drug delivery systems. These are primarily all the recent systems which are combinations of solid microparticles in a mucoadhesive gel base or these could be some specialized systems like microemulsions and or nanoemulsions which are loaded with one or more excipients which have an inherent property of adhesion. Dear students, by now we have understood that we have got different types of mucoadhesive dosage forms. It is also important for all of us to clarify that like we have different types of mucoadhesive drug delivery systems, we will also have certain specific target sites for each one of them. This table summarizes the various types of mucoadhesive dosage forms which are focused to be used on specific target sites. To begin with, if we have oral cavity, which can primarily be either the buccal site or the sublingual site or the dental site, to take care of such target sites, we have dosage forms like bioadhesive or mucoadhesive tablets, gels, patches, ointments, sprays, lozenges and insert forms. The latter that is the insert form primarily could be used for periodontal cavity. Then for the eyes at the target site we can have mucoadhesive based nanoemulsions microemulsions, in situ gel preparations or ocular inserts. The GIT membrane is a primary target site wherein we can have a variety of mucoadhesive dosage forms to be used which could include the macroparticle multi-unit system, we can have microparticles or microcapsules which are mucoadhesive or we can have specially designed mucoadhesive tablets as well. At the nasal end we have formulations which could be mucoadhesive drops, nanoemulsions or microemulsions. The sites which are gender specific like your vaginal or cervix or the other site like the rectal luminal Lumen is primarily useful for the delivery of drug in the form of bioadhesive or mucoadhesive tablets, suppositories, patches, gels, microparticle based gels, nanoemulsion or microemulsion gels. The point to be remembered is that one of the ingredients or polymers or excipients essentially should be able to give the mucoadhesion. On the skin, we can have dressings, bandages and patches as the choice or the chosen dosage forms. Advantages of mucoadhesive drug delivery systems. In the last few slides, we have understood that mucoadhesive drug delivery system could be easily targeted at different target sites and these offer several advantages over the conventional drug delivery systems. To begin with, primarily a mucoadhesive drug delivery system prolongs the residence time of the dosage form at the site of absorption or the site of action and primarily it will eventually increase the bioavailability. Not to mention, it offers an excellent accessibility. Rapid onset of action is also possible. Because of the enormous blood supply and good perfusion rates, we can also expect a rapid absorption of drug through the mucoadhesive drug delivery systems. It can also give us 
an alternative to the normal routine oral route whereby we can use a buccal drug delivery system and it will offer to protect the drug from degradation in the acidic environment of the GIT. Of course, one of the very distinct advantage is its better patient compliance. If used locally, it would really help to have a rapid cellular recovery and it will accentuate the local healing of the tissue. It also additionally offers reduced dosing frequency and a shorter treatment period. The mucoadhesive drug delivery systems per se will help us to increase the safety margin of high potency drugs and offer a better control of plasma levels. It also has an advantage that we can have a maximum utilization of drug enabling reduction in total amount of drug administered and in the long run we can drastically reduce the side effects. Disadvantages of mucoadhesive drug delivery systems. We just finished with the distinct advantages of mucoadhesive drug delivery systems. The succeeding section would now highlight the various disadvantages, generally speaking, of different types of mucoadhesive drug delivery systems. The first one is something related to the oral mucosa. The drugs which irritate the oral mucosa or have a bitter or unpleasant taste odor cannot be administered by this route. Similarly, the drugs which are unstable at the buccal pH cannot be administered by this route. Additionally, drugs with small dose requirements could be administered. There is another distinct disadvantage with the buccal drug delivery system, that is, the drugs may be swallowed along with the saliva and might you lose the advantage of the buccal root usage. Also, only those drugs which are absorbed by passive diffusion can be administered by this route. Additionally, eating and drinking may become restricted. It is apparent that the disadvantages associated with mucoadhesive drug delivery systems are also linked to the specific site of administration. In case of vaginal drug delivery, the drug has to be stable in the acidic vaginal pH. It is also understood that a mucoadhesive vaginal formulation could interfere with sexual intercourse. Additionally, the vaginal formulation may leak and cause messiness which is a distinct disadvantage. Not only this, the vaginal mucoadhesive formulation may be primarily contraindicated in case of pregnancy. Similarly, as we talk about the target site of eye, in case of ocular formulations, the formulation may cause uneasiness and blurring of vision. It may get dislodged. And if we talk of the nasal formulations, the presence of the formulation may stimulate sneezing and subsequent dislodgement of the formulation from the nasal cavity may happen. It might also irritate and the sensitive nasal mucosa. In general, overhydration may lead to the formation of slippery surface and structural integrity of the formulation may get disrupted by the swelling and hydration of the bioadhesive polymers. One of our other major learning objective was to get accustomed and acquainted to the human mucous membrane. We'll very quickly take an overview of the same. It is understood 
that mucous membranes are moist surfaces covering walls of body cavities like gastrointestinal, rectal, vaginal, GIT and respiratory tract. The main administration site for bioadhesive systems and allow the fast drug absorption due to its high permeability. In order to sum up, the various mucosal sites where the drug administration via mucoadhesive systems is obtained, we have them as number one, gastrointestinal site, then we have the nasal site, ocular focused on the eye delivery, vaginal which is a gender specific site, the buccal cavity, then we have the rectal lumina, we have the oral site and we have the periodontal cavity. In order to understand the level of interaction of mucoadhesive drug delivery system with the mucosal site, we should understand the structure of the mucosa. There are different body sites, therefore the types of the mucosa which would be present will also differ. Primarily, a structure of mucosa is usually consisting of the epithelial layer which could primarily be single layered in case of stomach, small and large intestines and the bronchi whereas it is stratified or multi-layered in case of esophagus, vagina and cornea. The layer of the connective tissue is usually followed by the submucosa which consists of the blood vessels and nerves and later on attached to the muscle or the bone. The diagram in front of your screen is usually from the oral cavity. So you can see the oral epithelium marked on the upper end. The thickness of such epithelia can be varied for different types of organ sites. It is around 50 to 450 micrometers thick in the stomach area, whereas in case of the oral cavity, it is as less as 1 micrometer. The mucosal surface is drenched with the mucus. The mucus comprises of glycoproteins, lipids, inorganic salts and about 95% of water. The non-mucin components of mucus contains secretory IgA, lactoferrin, lysozyme, polysaccharides, lipids and various other ionic species. In a nutshell, the composition will speak as it consists of 95% of water, around 0.5-5% to of glycoprotein and lipid, it also has around 1% of mineral salt and around 0.5 to 1% of free proteins. The mucus glycoproteins are high molecular proteins with oligopolysaccharide units like the L-fructose, D-galactose, N-acetyl-D-glucosamine, N-acetyl-D-galactosamine and sialic acid. We now move on to discuss the functions of mucus. It primarily has got five important roles to play. The first one is being protective. Mucosa by means of its hydrophobicity protects the epithelial surface from the hydrochloric acid diffusion from the lumen. The second important role is it results in the cell-cell adhesion. Mucus has strong cohesive properties and binds to the epithelial cell surface as a continuous gel layer. The third important role is that of providing lubrication. Mucus helps in maintaining the hydrated state of the mucosal membrane. Goblet cells continuously secrete mucus thus compensating for the gradual elimination of the mucus layer due to digestion, microbial degradation 
and solubilization of mucin molecules. The next important role is bioadhesion. The mucus carries a negative charge at the physiological pH due to the presence of sialic acid and sulfate moieties. This high charge density due to negative charge majorly contributes to the action of bioadhesion. The last but very important role is that of acting as a barrier. Mucus acts as a diffusion barrier for molecules as well as drugs. The diffusion of the drug through the mucus depends on its physiochemical properties such as charge, molecular weight, hydration radius and hydrogen bonding capacity. Also, the nature of the mucus determines the diffusion such as glycoprotein concentration, cross-linking ratio, average molecular weight between two junctions in the mucus network. Students, now when we have understood the structure of the mucosal membrane and the composition of the mucus, we will be in a better position to understand the mechanism of mucoaddition. The slide in front of you primarily stresses upon that the mucoaddition is a two-step approach. It has got two primary stages. The first stage, as evident by the dosage form, which is shown in the green circle, this dosage form probably will be with very little pressure brought into contact with the mucous membrane, which is drenched with the mucous layer. This stage, which will help in an intimate interaction, will be called as a contact stage. Later on, when this particular interaction area of the dosage form will get deeper in touch with the mucous membrane, it will help in better interpenetration. And this better interpenetration will help the polymer to adhere with a lot of force because of the interfacial tension and later on this will result in very intimate contact of the drug dosage form with the mucous membrane. This latter stage which helps in the consolidation of the dosage form with the mucous membrane is called as stage of consolidation. In order to better understand the process of mucoaddition, and then their use in the mucoadhesive drug delivery systems. Over the few decades, various scientists, including Jimenez Costellanos and Andrews et al., proposed various theories. The five main theories which have been associated with the phenomena of mucoadhesions can be summed up as the wetting theory of mucoadhesion, the electrostatic theory of mucoadhesion, the diffusion theory of mucoaddition, the adsorption theory of mucoaddition, and finally, the fracture theory of mucoaddition. We will discuss each one of them one by one. The first amongst the theories of mucoaddition is the wetting theory of mucoaddition. The wetting theory is the most conventional theory of addition. It describes addition as an embedding process wherein bioadhesives or the mucoadhesives penetrate into the irregularities of the biological substrate and eventually harden resulting in exposure of the adhesive sites. It is primarily applicable to liquid bioadhesives or bioadhesives with low viscosity and measures the work of adhesion and spreadability of the adhesive on the biological substrate. As just mentioned, the wetting theory is more applicable to the liquid bioadhesives. Let us discuss it in context with the liquid bioadhesives. The theory discussed by Young gave 
the primary approach to determine the affinity of a liquid on a biological substrate. This theory determines the performance of the bioadhesive by determining the contact angle of a liquid bioadhesive drop resting on a flat solid surface when equilibrium is reached. The wetting action is influenced by three surface tensions. Number one, surface tensions at the interface of the liquid and the vapor phases gamma L. B, the surface tensions at the interface of the solid and vapor phases designated as gamma S. And C, the surface tensions at the interface of the solid and the liquid phases designated by gamma SL. This could be well placed into an equation like gamma S equals to gamma SL plus gamma SL cos theta. Thus, if the contact angle is between solid substrate and the liquid is 0 degrees, then a complete wetting is obtained. However, an angle of contact greater than 0 degrees results in inadequate wetting and as it approaches 180 degrees centigrade, wetting becomes insignificant. The wetting ability of the liquid on a solid is determined in terms of spreading coefficient s, which is given by s that is designating the spreading coefficient is equal to gamma ml in brackets cos theta minus 1. Thus, for a complete spontaneous wetting, the contact angle should be equal or close to 0. For a solid bioadhesive, in case of a solid bioadhesive or a bioadhesive with low viscosity, spreadability is determined by the difference of work of addition and a work of cohesion. The work of addition required to counter the surface tension at the interface between the two materials on a biological substrate is govern, given by the following equation. Omega A equals to gamma P plus gamma B minus gamma PB, where omega is the work of addition or omega A is the work of addition and gamma P, gamma B and gamma PB are the surface tensions of the bioadhesive polymer, the substrate and the interfacial tension respectively. On the other hand, the work of cohesion is calculated by omega C equals to 2 times gamma P or gamma B. Conclusively, for a solid bioadhesive material, the spreading coefficient is given by the difference of gamma omega A minus omega C. It can also be deduced that the SPB, that is the spreading coefficient between the polymer and the substrate, is given by the equation as SPB equal to omega P minus omega B plus omega PB. The equation thus indicates that greater the surface tension of the adhesive polymer and the substrate as compared to the interfacial tensions, the greater is the work of addition. That is, greater energy would be required to separate the two surfaces. The second theory which we are going to discuss is the electro electrostatic theory of mucoaddition. It is primarily based on the premise that the mucoadhesive and the biological substances carry opposite charges. The transfer of electrons occurs on contact. 
it results in an electrical double layer at the interface of the adhesive and the substrate and a series of attractive forces leading to a sustained connection between the two layers. This attractive force between the electrical double layers determine the mucoadhesive strength. The second theory which we will discuss is the diffusion theory of mucoaddition. Here, the bioadhesive polymer chains interpenetrate into the glycoprotein mucin chains driven by concentration gradient. It results in a semi-permanent adhesive bond formation. The adhesion force increases with an increase in the penetration depth. The estimated depth required for a good bioaddition normally range between 0.2 to 0.5 micrometers. The mean diffusional depth of the bioadhesive polymer L is given by L is the square root of T into dB, where D is the diffusion coefficient and T is the contact time. After understanding the various characteristics of the mucoadhesive polymers, let us try to understand how these polymers could be classified. We can classify them many ways. The first base, basis of classification is there based on its specificity. So we can have two types of mucoadhesive polymers. The first one that is called as the specific bioadhesive polymers. These are called so because they have the ability to adhere to specific chemical structures within the biological molecules and examples are lectins and fibrins. The other under this category are the non-specific bioadhesive polymers. As understood from the word non-specific, these do not have the ability to bind to specific cell surfaces, but they would generally bind to all cell surfaces and mucosal layers. Examples are polyacrylic acid and cyanoacrylates. Another way of classifying the polymers is primarily based on its origin. We can have two types like synthetic polymers and natural polymers. Under the synthetic polymers, we could have cellulose derivatives exemplified by methyl cellulose, ethyl cellulose, hydroxyethyl cellulose and sodium carboxymethyl cellulose. Similarly, we can have polyacrylic acid polymers which can also be referred to as carbomers. We can have polycarbophil, polymethylacrylate. We can have polyethylene oxide and another examples could be polyvinyl pyrolidone and polyvinyl alcohol. Under the natural polymers, we can have typical examples like that of tregacanth, sodium alginate, caraya gum, gelatin, chitosan and hyaluronic acid and others. This table primarily accentuates the various levels of mucoadhesive forces which has been shown by different categories of polymers. You can see in front of you that in the last column we have the parameters designating the quality of bioaddition in terms of its being excellent, fair or poor. The polymers like that of CMC, carbopole and tragacanth are showing excellent quality of bioaddition whereas gelatin is showing a fair quality of bioaddition and the polymers like providon and acacia and pectin are showing very poor type of bioaddition. The qualitative difference of the bioaddition forces is because of the behavior of the polymer in contact with the surfacial mucosa. The success of the mucoadhesive drug delivery system primarily, primarily relies on the selection of the bioadhesive or mucoadhesive polymers. Therefore, these require to have certain very specific characteristics. 
we will try to discuss each one of them one after the other. The first one is the flexibility. It is important because it controls the extent of interpenetration between the polymers and the mucosal epithelial surfaces. The second important characteristic is the hydrophilicity. Polymers that are hydrophilic in nature are able to form strong adhesive bonds with mucosal membranes because the mucus layer contains large quantity, large quantity or large amounts of water. The third important characteristic which a polymer should have is the capacity of eliciting the hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding between the entangled polymer chains form strong adhesive bonds. Therefore, the presence of hydrogen bond forming groups such as OH and COOH are vital in large quantities. More are number of the OH and COH groups, more is the bioaddition capacity. The next one which is important characteristic of a polymer is its high molecular weight. The polymers with a high molecular weight are desirable because they will provide a large number of bonding sites. More are the number of bonding sites, stronger is the mucoaddition force. Then we move on to another important characteristic that is the surface tension. Surface tension is needed to spread the bioadhesive polymer onto the mucosal layer of the epithelial surface. Additionally, it should of course be non-toxic and non-absorbable and non-irritant. Students, by now we understand that the mucoadhesive drug delivery systems are used at different sites of mucosal membranes. In all the cases, they should essentially be non-toxic and therefore should be non-irritant as well. They should also have the ability to form a strong non-covalent bond with the mucosal membrane. It should rapidly adhere to the mucosal surface and it should also possess site specificity. Finally or additionally, it should allow easy incorporation of the drugs and should offer no hindrance to its release. It should be stable and retain its properties on storage or during the shelf life of the product. And of course, it should be inexpensive so that the prepared dosage form remains economical. The next theory in place is referred to as the adsorption theory. According to this theory, the two surfaces adhere on contact with each other because of surface forces acting between the chemical moieties present on both surfaces. Two types of chemical interactions can be differentiated. The first is primary bonds due to chemical bonds of covalent, ionic or metallic nature. These types of bonds result in permanent bonds due to high strength and therefore are not desirable for bioaddition. It is noted here that such type of strong bonds are not helpful or desired for bioaddition. The second type of bonds which are present are called as the secondary chemical bonds having one or more secondary forces. The forces could be van der Waals forces, forces due to hydrogen bonding and due to hydrophobic bonding. These bonds are semi-permanent and require lesser energy to break. Thus, these are the most desirable in the process of bioaddition. The last of the theories which we would discuss is referred to as the fracture theory of mucoaddition. This is again one of the most commonly used theories. It determines the force required to overcome the adhesive force in order to separate the two surfaces after addition is established. This theory relates the force required for polymer separation to the strength of their adhesive bond. 
the fracture strength is given by the equation sigma equals to e into epsilon by l the square root of the same where sigma is the fracture strength epsilon is the fracture energy e is the young modulus of elasticity and l is the crack length it primarily depends upon the fact that there would be certain areas of fracture at both the substrate level as well as the polymer level the bioaddition or the mucoaddition is the outcome of the interaction of these fractures on both the surfaces with this we end the theories of mucoaddition after understanding all the nuances of how a mucoadhesive drug delivery system will interact with the mucosal surface we need to now understand the primary component which is responsible for giving this mucoadhesive property and these are mucoadhesive polymers a bio or a mucoadhesive polymer is a synthetic or a natural polymer which binds to the biological substrates such as mucosal membranes and sometimes they are referred to as biological glues in a mucoadhesive or a bioadhesive drug delivery system the drug molecule is either dispersed in matrix of polymer which is called as a matrix type polymer drug delivery system or this matrix type is coated with a bio or a mucoadhesive polymer students we just talked about the second generation polymers and one category which we discussed was the thiolated polymers the next important newer generation polymers which are of the research area interest nowadays constitutes of the lactin mediated mucoadhesive polymers they are primarily proteins or glycoprotein complexes of non immune origin they bind with the cell surface carbohydrates in a non covalent fashion they are very very peculiar and unique where they will have a specific receptor mediated interaction this will allow direct contact with the cell surface rather than the mucus the point which i would emphasize here is that these lactin mediated mucoadhesive polymers deep go deep down into the cell surface and even transcend the mucus membrane it helps in better localization and better internalization of the drug or the carrier system and hence enhances the mucosal drug delivery it ensures targeting and specific binding of the dosage form and controlling the drug release to prolong the therapeutic action in conclusion what we can say students that lactinomimetics or lactin like molecules carrying only the active site of natural lactin holds attractive future as bioadhesives in the decades beginning from the early 2000s there has been a continuous consistent progression of the drug delivery systems based on the mucoaddition the recent researchers have attempted to classify the mucoadhesive polymers keeping in view the old ones and the new ones on the premise of calling them as the first generation polymers and the second generation polymers in the subsequent slides we would try to understand that which polymers come under the first generation category and which one are covered under the second generation category scientists like carvello et al and andrews et al attempted to classify the older polymers under the category of first generation polymers the first generation polymers consists primarily of hydrophilic polymers either natural or synthetic which act essentially by electrostatic interactions these polymers for better understanding are subdivided into three categories namely cationic first generation polymers 
anionic first generation polymers and non ionic first generation polymers cationic polymers being positive charged interact with the negatively charged mucous surface chitosan is a widely accepted biocompatible and biodegradable polymer of this category it is an n deacetylated derivative of the polysaccharide chitin soluble in water at a ph less than 6.5 the positively charged amino groups present in the polymer are primarily responsible for the electrostatic interaction with the negatively charged sialic group of the mucin present on the mucous layer in addition the hydroxyl and amino groups present also interact with the mucus via hydrogen bonding because of its excellent bioadhesive properties it is extensively used in drug delivery systems the linearity of the chitosan chain increases its flexibility and penetrability apart from the mucoadhesive properties chitosan is also reported to increase absorption of hydrophilic molecules by the structural reorganization of the proteins associated with the intercellular junctions anionic polymers anionic polymers such as those derived from polyacrylic acid are negatively charged and interact with the mucosal surface via hydrophobic interactions hydrogen and van der waal bonds the anionic polymers possess carboxyl and sulfate functional groups giving it a net overall negative charge in solution with ph more than the pk of the polymer examples of anionic mucoadhesive polymers primarily include polyacrylic acids and its derivatives and sodium carboxymethyl cellulose both these polymers form strong hydrogen bonds with mucin and are preferred polymers for making various types of mucoadhesive drug delivery systems a classical example of an anionic category of mucoadhesive polymers is the poly polyacrylic acid derivatives such as polycarbophil these are water insoluble but have variable swelling capacities and usually form viscous gels on swelling such polymer results in high degree of entanglement with the mucus the unionized carboxyl group binds with the mucin via the hydrogen bonding polycarbophil is usually available in a broad range of molecular weights it usually forms transparent easily modified gel networks and is primarily non irritant non toxic and considered as safe it belongs to the gras category as advised by the fda the word gras is elaborated as generally recognized as safe another derivative of polyacrylic acid polymer carbomer differs from polycarbophil in the level of its cross linking the former are cross linked with allyl sucrose or allyl pentaerythritol whereas the latter are cross linked with divinyl glycol this difference of the usage of different cross linking agent and the extent to which cross linking has occurred results in different types of derivatives of polyacrylic acid known as carbomers both compounds have the same acrylic backbone but vary in their cross link density another anionic polymers which are used very commonly are the carboxymethyl cellulose polymers and also the alginates 
alginates are another class which probably is used primarily for the production of mucoadhesive multi-unit particles known as mucoadhesive microparticles. The last of the first generation polymers are referred to as the non-ionic category of mucoadhesive polymers. The typical examples include hydroxypropyl methyl cellulose that is HPMC, hydroxyethyl cellulose that is HEC and methyl cellulose. These categories of polymers usually extend a weaker mucoaddition force as compared to the anionic or cationic polymers and are not generally preferred for making of the mucoadhesive drug delivery systems. Despite the availability of many types of first generation polymers, there are certain limitations which probably were limiting its usage in the progressive mucoadhesive drug delivery designing. These first generation polymers are also referred to as the off the shelf polymers and primarily have the following limitations associated with them. The first of it is non-specificity, non-targeting capacity and probably they usually end up having short retention time. They also exhibit weak non-covalent interactions and such limitations probably paved way for the second generation polymers. As just mentioned a while ago, there are certain limitations of the first generation polymers which are usually successfully overcome by the second generation polymers. They have distinct advantages over the first category and the advantages are summed up as number one is its ability to carry drugs with different physiochemical properties. The mucoadhesive drug delivery system dosage form is usually a platform and this platform should be amenable to the use of different types of drugs. This second generation polymers also offered subsequent mucoadhesive properties for both solid and liquid forms. It also exhibited the ability to inhibit local enzymes or promote absorption. They were site specific. They are probably having better targetability. They also boast of improved chemical interactions. They are supposedly also able to give stimulation of endocytosis. And finally, they have a very broad safety range. One amongst the many second generation polymers is the thiolated mucoadhesive polymer. Thiolated polymers or thiomers are obtained by additions of thiol groups to hydrophilic polymers like such as polyacrylates, chitosan or deacetylated gallon gum. Thus, Thiomers are hydrophilic macromolecules bearing free thiol groups on the polymeric support. The, cardo, the carbodimide mediated thiol group modifies various features of the polyacrylates and chitosan. This results in improved covalent interaction of the free thiol group with the cysteine rich residues of mucous glycoproteins by formation of strong disulfide bond. Unlike non-covalent interactions of the first generation polymers, covalent bonding ability of these polymers makes the interaction less prone to changes in ionic strength or a change in the pH. This improves the residence time enabling prolonged retention and better therapeutic outcome. 
Furthermore, the presence of disulfide bonds may also affect the drug release from the delivery system due to increased rigidity and cross-linking. Thus, a diffusion-controlled drug release mechanism is characteristic of these polymers, whereas an anomalous transport of API into bulk solution is more common in case of first-generation polymers. In addition, thiolated polymers present other advantages such as better tensile strength, water uptake, and rapid swelling. In a study evaluating thiolated chitosin, an increased mucoadhesive property was observed due to formation of disulfide linkages with cysteine residues of the mucous glycoproteins. These were also found to possess strong cohesive properties, making them highly suitable excipients for controlled drug release dosage forms. Furthermore, they also exhibit anti-protease activity by binding with divalent cations such as zinc and magnesium, which are cofactors for many proteases. These properties make thiolated chitosin as an interesting carrier system for delivering peptides and proteins in the mucosal membrane. My dear students, so finally we have come to the conclusion of today's module. We will very quickly summarize what we have learned in the module of mucoadhesive drug delivery system. The first conclusion which we can draw is that the mucoadhesive drug delivery system offers prolonged contact at the site of administration, it facilitates better interaction with the surface, delivers the drug at the target site and eventually increases the bioavailability. It also has a very distinct advantage of high level of patient compliance. We have learned over the period that the polymer plays an important role. So what we can conclude is the formulation of mucoadhesive drug delivery system depends on the selection of suitable polymer with excellent mucoadhesive properties and so also biocompatibility. We are also having newer polymers with better specificity and these are being researched upon. These are called as the second generation mucoadhesive polymers and we can exemplify them by something like the lectinomimetic and something like the thiol type of polymers. These polymers offer greater attachment and retention of dosage forms and these can be helpful in making a much much better mucoadhesive drug delivery system.